Take your Bible. We're, there's one little place in Genesis 28 that I'm going to touch on very quickly. When a preacher says that, that's his whole sermon. But um, just, I, there's a lot of misunderstanding, especially on your internet. And Sister Betty, I really appreciate you telling me what you were telling me today. It's a perfect example. If you listen to me during the week, you're going to hear me unload on internet conspiracy theories. And I mean absolutely unload on them. I never would have thought that it would get as bad as what it is. She came to me after church today and she said <clears throat> that, or somebody, that somebody had, was showing her a picture and she said, Betty, what does this look like to you? Who does this look like to you? And Betty said, well, it, it kind of looks like Princess Diana being the age she should be if she were alive right now. And the lady said, that's exactly what happened. Princess Diana did not die in that car crash. She's still alive. And she, this, she said, this lady kept on talking, talking, talking. And but finally, Betty said, I just quit listening to her. I'm just going, what in the world? Yeah, she's, they've got people scaring. Listen, it's all scare tactics. But scaring people into believing that everybody's going to lose their Medicare next year. Now, um, and the reason why I bring this up is just briefly we're going to talk about tithing. And there's some very, very, what I call false beliefs and false understandings on tithing and what it's for. Uh, and, and it starts with people on the Bible who think they know everything. And um, they don't know everything. And I know for a fact they don't know everything because they haven't checked with me. But anyway, that was funny. Anyway... <clears throat> Um, the whole flat earth theory, that, that there, no, there wasn't anybody that believed the earth was flat. Nobody, there was, like, there was a flat earth society, and there still is. And they have hardly anybody that was serious about it until 2016, a guy named Mark Sargent put a, about an hour long video on YouTube where he made some of the dumbest observations about the shape of the earth and how the government's been lying to us, NASA's been lying to us. Uh, there, is no, there is no outer space. There's a hard dome shell over a, a flat piece of ground. And um, all... all of the governments are lying and covering it up. NASA is lying and covering it up. All of the air pilots are covering it up. Um, the people who come up with GPSs for your phones and your cars and everything like that, they're covering it up. It's all a big cover up. You have millions and millions of people in on the cover up which doesn't leave too many other people to actually just believe in it. But that's gotten a revival in the last eight years. <clears throat> and it's sort of like the National Enquirer in its glory days. They have kind of had too many lawsuits against them to really just keep making stuff up and printing it. So they have to be somewhat careful. But back in their heyday when Bat Boy was on there every other week and all this other nonsense, that's what a large portion of the internet has turned into. It's turned into um, conspiracy theories and nonsense and, and just outright lies. Uh, who remembers, cut to the chase, tell me when it's going to be. And he said, September 25th which is next week. He even gave me a time. It was like 
4.56 a.m. Jerusalem time or something like that. And I wrote that down. And I said, here's what I'm going to do. On September 26th, I'm going to call you and ask you what went wrong. What do you mean you don't believe me? I said, well, no, I'll be honest with you, I don't. You haven't even heard everything I said. I said, well, we'll just see, won't we? If you're right, I won't make a phone call. Be no need to. I said, if you're wrong, I'm going to call you. And I'm going to ask you what went wrong. He slammed the phone down on me. And um, people like that, Sister Betty, they're everywhere. And they just pass on some of the craziest, nuttiest ideas I've ever heard of in my life. And I, I usually just confront them. As this is not right according to the Bible. I had a guy come down here one time and I really got a bad feeling about this guy. And it was so bad, just him talking to me, that I sent a text to Michael. I said, Michael, come down to the bottom of the steps here. And I said, just kind of hang out there and listen. So I don't know what this guy's going to do. He admitted to me that he was homeless. He had a car. He had all his junk in it. And he had a computer out there. And he came in. I let him come in in the fellowship hall there. And I, he talked to me a little bit. And I don't remember what it was, but he had some kind of weird, weird doctrine. And I started telling him, I said, well, just run it by me. He said, well, I have to really build up to it. I said, just cut to the chase. Tell me what it is. And he said something. I don't remember what it was. And I sat there and thought about it for a while. And I'm going, no, that violates scripture. Can't be done. Scripture cannot be broken, period. So no matter what somebody comes up with, scripture cannot be broken. If it violates scripture, it's not true. And what he wanted to do was go out. He said, if I could just go out in the car, bring in my computer system, hook it into your network. And I went, no, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Isaiah's back there going, mm-mm, don't you do that. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And the more I disbelieved him, the more agitated he got. And he was a big guy. And I'm just going, I hope Mike's standing over there. And finally, when he knew I wasn't going to believe it, he just grabbed his stuff and walked out voluntarily, which I'm glad that he did. Um, now, when it comes to tithing, let, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> and I'll pray until this mint's gone. How's that? Father, we do love you and we thank you, Lord, for a good day that you've given us. We ask for your blessings. Lord, we need showers of blessings tonight. That'll feed us, that'll cause us to grow, that'll fill us. Lord, give us rain, give us sunshine. Cause the wind to blow upon us with your favor on it. Father, we love you. And Lord, you've taught us so many things. You've blessed us with so many things. You've done so many things for us. God, I can't get over you. And how good you are to me. That means the world to me. And I just, I, I won't serve another God because of who you are to me. Thank you for you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads us, that comforts us, that causes us to have the fear of the Lord indwelling in us so that we rightly, reverently, and respect Respect the presence of a thrice holy God in our midst every time we gather together. Bless your word tonight. Teach us. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, <clears throat> in uh, Genesis 28, I'm going to fix this. And I'm doing this kind of lubricate my throat tonight. 
Genesis 28, the last two verses of that chapter um, mention something that Jacob vowed to God voluntarily. And it was tithing. Uh, in verse 20 of Genesis 28, Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way. And if you underline things, you buy, underline the word way. Or if you've got a notebook and you keep notes, write the word way down. And then study that word. Starting in Genesis, and it's going to be a long study. I don't know how many times it's in there, but I bet the word way is in there quite a few times. You might want to reduce it to the way. Because what did I just say? The way. What does that make you think of? I am the way. The truth. The drunkards of Ephraim in Isaiah 28 are out of the way. Through wine and strong drink. They are out of the way. Which means that the wine and strong drink of their false beliefs and false doctrine causes them to not be in the way. If you're in the way, you are in Christ. Because he is not a way, he's the way. So, he's saying here what I think and will keep me in this way. That I go. The way is Christ. And will give me bread to eat. Raiment to put on. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. What he means by that is. I believe death. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone. Remember this is at Bethel. He's seen the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. Think of what Jesus said when he asked Peter, he asked some of the disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're that prophet. And he said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, I believe, or something like that. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my house. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he sets up a pillar, a rock. This is God's house. And he said, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now again, this is before the law. This was before the Ten Commandments. This was before the book of Levi, where you find all the things that you tithe on. What does the word tithe mean? Ten. It's a ten. You see, God made it easy, didn't he? He didn't say, now I want 8.6789998% of your monthly gross income plus... 12% of the increase of your cattle plus 4.998% um, of the increase of your... He didn't say that. A flat... I, I think America needs to go to a flat tax rate. Make it one tax for everybody. That way everybody pays the same percentage. Rich people... Poor people, doesn't matter who they are. They all pay the same. And, it's, and it won't hurt anybody. You say, well, I don't make much money. Then you don't have to pay much. It's, it's that simple. So anyway, <clears throat> God made it easy. Because the easiest division to do in the world is to figure out one-tenth of something. It is. It's the easiest, easiest math in the world to do. So God set up, or excuse me, 
God eventually set up the law of tithing, but here you have Jacob tithing and he's doing it voluntarily. We have another example of that in the Bible, in Genesis 14, which we've already covered. But here we have Melchizedek, king of Salem. Some say Melchizedek is Jesus. Uh, I tend to believe that it is that it is a Melchizedek is an angel who is um, a priest and the order of priest as an angel that he is, is is named after him the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you believe it's Jesus, I'm, it's no big deal to me. It's, it's nothing. That's just what I personally believe. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, meaning Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. Abram did this voluntarily so you have people who have I mean some funny views on money that's collected by the church yet you have some people that are way out there that said oh churches don't need no money they don't need no money they're all a bunch of money grubbers anyway well where do people think that these electric light bulbs come from? How, how much do you think it costs this church to run that fan every year? Probably quite a bit. Um, how, how do we feed people halfway across the world? How do we maintain the radio stations? How do we send out the DVDs we send out every month without billing anybody for a single one. How do we do that? Um, it's just by what they call free will offerings. We don't demand it. We don't, we don't, as a church, examine your tithing record and at the end of the year send you a bill for what you owe. Now, believe it or not, some churches do. And when I heard that, I couldn't believe it. They said, oh yeah, the pastor get, then gets involved. And he goes through the records. And if you're behind on your tithing, he types up a letter and says, according to your income, you make such and such a year. However, you tithe this much a year this year and so that tells us you are behind on your tithing please remit by the end of the year it's mormons but it's not just mormons huh and it's not just catholic not just lutheran i know some baptist preachers that do it and to me that's just wicked that's just downright dirty it is just downright just downright dirty uh, number one, the pastor should stay out of it. He should stay out of it. That I do not know in this room right now, I could not stand here if you put a pistol to my head and said, you had to tell me how much I paid in tithes or I'm going to blow your brains out. Cock the trigger. Because I do not know. I make it a point not to know. And, and I've, even as a young pastor, I've had that as a policy, a own personal policy, because I know me. I could start getting jealous or I could start getting praiseworthy. Mad that some people don't tithe and glad handing people that I know tithe and they're the good people of the church. And I'll call them out from the pulpit. Oh, God bless brother and sister so and so. Oh, they just give and oh, they just do everything for our church. And oh, they're the greatest people in all of our church. What does that tell everybody else? The rest of you chopped livers, 
need to be like them. And I just think that's wrong. But anyway, that, that's one group. Then you have another group, and I see this group all the time. There ain't nothing in the Bible where preachers should get paid. In fact, all that money churches take in, none of that should go to the preacher. Preachers ain't supposed to get paid. They're the men of God. And men of God don't serve God for money. That's, in fact, that's wicked. They've got two masters. They're trying to serve Jesus, and they're trying to serve mammon. And I just don't think that's right. And, and if you go to any church... Well, that pastor getting a salary from that church, you hightail it out of there. They're all about money. You need to leave that place and go on. I don't believe that either. I don't think that that ain't right. That is not right. The Old Testament purpose for tithing was because God did and would not allow the Levite priest to have a portion of the land. Their portion was God. They inherited God. And his service. So there was, a, there was always an order. Uh, if you remember, uh, who was it? Um, Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah? Is that him? He, had, he was in a particular order of the priesthood that had a certain time when they went to Jerusalem. No matter where they lived, they had a certain time when they went to Jerusalem to do their order of the service. They had their time, they had their job that they did, and when that season was over, they left off and somebody else came in and took uh, their place. Now, they were not allowed to own farms, they were not allowed to own vineyards, they were not allowed to own cattle, they were not allowed to do anything like that. What was the tithe for? It was to provide, number one, there was a tithe of shekels, money, and there was a tithe of the sacrifice that came in. And God actually specified how much of a lamb, how much of an ox, how much of a goat, how much of a dove, how much of the flour, the olive oil and spices that came in. God actually gave the Levite priests a worthy portion. In fact, in some, if things were going well, some of those Levites did so well, they could sell their surplus at the market and have money. Um, so anyway, that was how they made their living. Now, the same principle then moves forward to the New Testament. Even though we don't have a priesthood of the pastor, we do have the priesthood of the believer. But the pastor then, uh, this, came, this issue came up when the apostles were trying to preach, they were trying to study, and there was a discontentment about the, the, the distribution of the food and so on. And people were going, we're not getting waited on at all. And you got these people, you know, and th there was just a problem going on. So the apostles got together and said, guys, and, you know, let's be honest. Our calling and duty is to labor in the word of God. It is not meet that we should leave the word of God and go and serve tables. Now, it wasn't that they were too high and mighty to serve tables. It's just that that wasn't their portion. That wasn't their job. Their job was to labor in the word of God. And so the idea that a pastor should not earn his income by being a pastor and by laboring in the word of God and so on is an unbiblical idea. Paul said, muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn, which means you don't put a muzzle over that ox's mouth and he can't eat of the corn that he labors to grind and mill for everybody else. The ox has got to eat. He's got to eat somehow. And then Paul said this, does God care for oxen? No, I'm the ox. Okay, big burly ox. And so, Paul again said, the servant is worthy of his hire. And so, it is, it is right and proper 
that people, when they give their tithes and they give their offerings, that an agreement is made by the pastor in the church of what his salary could be, what it should be, so on and so on and so on. They should come to an agreement by that. But if it, I've seen churches where they had the ability to have a full-time pastor. They just, for some reason, they just didn't think any pastor was worthy enough to be full-time. And he ain't too lazy to go out and get a job. Let him go out and get a job. And what it was about was... They wanted that church to build money, large stacks of it. Um, in one case, I know, well, I don't know the guy, but I know of a man in northwest Arkansas. He actually owned the church. I'm not saying he owned the building. He owned the church. And there was about 20 people in this church. And I knew a guy that said he was going to go pastor there, wanted me to pray for him. Well, I had heard about this church after he went there. And it's a church that chews up preachers in about a year or less. And it's because this one man, they said, you ought to see him. He's one of the ushers that takes up the offering. At, when they get done, he takes both plates, goes back in the back, and counts all the money, and deposits them in a special account of which he and he alone is responsible for. It was his own personal income system. And so he paid a small portion for the pastor. He paid the light bill. He paid this bill and paid that bill. And whatever was left over, that's his money. No kidding. And they told this guy that I know is a friend of mine. They said, if you go there, you're not staying long. Why is that? He said, because that guy is demanding. If you don't tow his line, you're out. And about every year, they have to find another preacher. It's usually some guy that really really needs a job somewhere now, I just hate that kind of stuff but anyway then you have the people that say well tithing's under the law we're not under the law we're under grace and um, turn to Malachi this is what John Uter and a man got into it over um, God asked the Israelites in, in uh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 Will a man rob, rob God yet you have robbed me but you say wherein have we robbed thee he said in tithes and offerings so John was just preaching a message on who can go to heaven and who can't and he read the list out of the book of Revelation for all that are without are thieves and robbers and wizards and all this stuff. It's a whole list of people that, you know, dogs and everything else, they can't get into the pearly gates. And he said that that idea of robbers, and he went to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Will he? Yeah, you've robbed God when you didn't tithe. Well, a man jumped him after church. A man was a member of that church. Jumped him and he said, "Yeah, that ain't, that, ain't, that doesn't, uh, uh, that's not for us. That's under the, that's in the Old Testament. That's under the law. That doesn't. We're in the age of grace." And uh, him and John kind of got into it. And the guy said this. He said, "Well, I bet me and you both know somebody who can clear this up." And John said, "Who's that?" And they said, "Mike Hoggard." And John said, "Here's his number right here. Call him." So the next day, John didn't call me and tell me what was going on. The guy called me and told me he was from John's church. And as he started talking, I figured John and this guy got into it over something. And I said, sir, well, let me ask you a question. Because this is, I think this is the key of the matter. Do you tithe? He said, well, sometimes. 
He said, but I help my family out a lot. I take that money and I, I'm helping people with it. I, that's what I do. I said, well, this is real simple then. I said, you're a thief. He didn't like that. You're, I said, you are robbing from God. You're stealing from him. I said, God did not tell you that the money belonged to you and you can disperse it how you want to and God gets the glory. God said, that 10% is mine. It was mine the moment you earned it. It was mine before they took the taxes out. It was mine Mine, mine, since the beginning of time, it was mine. Abraham did it voluntarily. Jacob here does it voluntarily. There is no law here. And you know what? When your heart is right with God, there doesn't need to be a law. You just do the right thing. Amen? Now, let's say, well, I don't know. Sometimes, you know how churches are. They can kind of blow money a little bit. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just real picky and careful about when I tithe. And, do you know God's watching that? If anybody in that church does anything wrong with money, don't you think God sees it? And if God sees it, do you think he's powerful enough and capable enough to do something about it himself? He sure enough is. Okay? So anyway, I just want to throw that in there. All right, now. Ta-da-da, ta-da-da, ta-da-da. Genesis chapter 29. We got a little bit of time left after that. And this is, boy, I like this kind of stuff right here. I love... These pictures in the Bible. Beautiful pictures that God has drawn for us to give us, under, give us knowledge first. Knowledge is reading your Bible. Reading your Bible. Um, boy, I hate to, I don't like to embarrass people, but tonight I just feel a little honorary, so I'm going to do it. Who in here can quote five verses out of your King James Bible, at least five verses out of your King James Bible? Raise your hand. You can quote them from memory. Okay. The rest of you get busy. Wouldn't you like, Matthew, Matthew wouldn't you like wisdom to raise these two to raise Mo and Larry here. Okay? You're curly. Wouldn't you like wisdom to raise Mo and Larry there? Okay? It's going to take it. It's going to take wisdom to raise those two daughters. Number one, because there's two daughters. Number two, we've already know that those daughters have needs. It's going to take wisdom from you, from Courtney, from Alicia, to Lindsay, Lisa, me. It's going to take wisdom from us. Hear my voice? It's going to take wisdom. I feel like Ernie from uh, My Three Sons. You know, when his voice changed, you remember that? But anyway, it, it'll take wisdom. Even now that my kids are adults, there's more wisdom now than I need than when they were little. I cannot get wisdom except I get understanding first. And I cannot get understanding if I don't have knowledge. Knowledge is knowing these stories in the Bible. And not just the generic version of them. Noah was in an ark. That's the generic version of it. But there's a lot more details in there. Knowledge is knowing what happened. Uh, the facts, the details. Who did Jacob go see? 
Who did he want to marry? Why did he want to marry her? Was there somebody else involved? What, what, was, what was wrong with the older sister? And what did um, Laban eventually do about it? And on and on and and and, and what then is uh, how how do we understand that story and what it means in the light of the rest of the scripture? And then what wisdom does it impart to us? Well, I'll give you one real super easy lesson that it will impart to you that a man still should only have one wife. Right? Because did them gals fight? They didn't like each other. Okay? So there's wisdom in that. I'm sure if Jacob at the end of his life had thought about it, he'd say, you know, if I would have just got Rachel, I think I would have stopped right there. But anyway, uh, I'm going to read down to verse 15 and we'll pick it up. Then Jacob went on. This is verse 1. Uh, his journey and came into the land of the people of the east and he looked behold a well in the field and lo there were uh, Three flocks of sheep lying by it for out of the well They watered the flocks and a great stone was upon the well's mouth and Thither were all the flocks gathered and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep And put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place Jacob said unto uh, them my brethren whence be ye and they said, of Haran are we. You know what? There's even a little bit. There's a mini sermon right here in verses 2 and 3. Water always represents refreshment. It represents the means of growth. We all must have water, whether you're plants, animals, or whatever. You must always have water. Water is the basis and source of life. Water is a type of the Word of God. It is the well that springs out of us into everlasting life. It is Christ. He's the well. Um, Christ cleanses the church, his bride, by the washing, by the word of God. But, oftentimes when we read it, there's a stone covering it. And we can't understand it. We can't get to it. We can't get refreshed by it. So what has to happen is somebody stronger than us must come and remove that stone so that you and I may drink of the fountain of life from the word of God. Does that make sense to everybody? So guess who that is? It's Christ. You ever run into a passage that you don't understand, you aggravate the daylights out of God. Knock on his door and don't stop till your knuckles bleed. And then when God answers, say, God, would you roll that stone out of the way so I can get some deep, cold water out of that well? I need this, God. I need to know what this means. Will you move that stone so I can get that thing? And God said, of course I will. I'm glad that you asked. In fact, I was on my way over there now when you called. I like that. Amen. See, that comes from knowing the Word of God and taking here a little and there a little and applying those ideas together. Now, it doesn't actually word for word say that in the text. But I know what water represents. I know what a stone covering it represents. It means you can't get to it. And I know the only one who can remove that stone is Christ. He's the one that can, it's just like him breaking the seals on the book. He's the only one that can do that. So, um, verse 4, And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. Now, Haran is uh, yeah, Laban's son. Yeah, I think so. Or, no, wait a minute. Heron is his dad. I'll get it figured out in a minute. Anyway. Um, he said, No, you Laban, the son of Nahor. And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. <clears throat> and he said, Lo, 
It is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered. Um, water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, and until, here it is, this is what I just said, till they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass. Boy, this girl must have been pretty. Love at first sight. Just like his daddy. As soon as his daddy, uh, Isaac, saw Rebecca, she come down off those camels. He grabbed her, said, you're my wife. And she comforted him over the loss of his mother. Mm. And so, Rachel, the pretty one, comes down there. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and he's like, look what I can do. And watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Now, there's every possibility that both... Um, Rebecca and Rachel were probably in their young teenage years. Every possibility of that, okay? That was very much accepted back then. Uh, they probably were already in the flower of age, able to have bare children. And um, so, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebecca's son and she ran and told her father and it came to pass when laban heard the tidings of jacob his sister's son that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him a lot of kissing going on here and brought him to his house and he told laban all these things and laban said to him surely thou art bone in my flesh that sounds like what adam said this is now bone of my bones flesh of my flesh in other words we're we're kin. Um, and um, he abode with him the space of a month. Now I'm sure by the text of it that Jacob didn't just lay around the house smoking a hookah all day long. So like, bring me some food over here. Knowing what we know from the context here, Jacob got up every morning with everybody else and went to work. I mean, he's staying with these people. He's going to earn his keep. So, verse 15 is what I have on the screen. Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught, for nothing? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed. Uh, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. Now remember, Leah is the older one. Rachel is the younger. She's much more prettier than her sister is. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Now again, commonly accepted that these girls if a man had girls that is as much different as it is in this world now if a man had two pretty girls he had a commodity on his hand he had something with which he could really barter himself and get himself some pretty good gain out of it so he gets out of Jacob seven years of free labor. So let's add this up, okay? JR, just, um, if a person made, let's say, $10 an hour at Hardee's, and they worked 40 hours in a week, 
So 40 times 10 is 400. So they make $400 a week. It's four weeks in a month. So that means they'll make $1,600 in that month times that times 12. Mama's reaching for a calculator. Okay, so how much a month? Huh? Well, that'd be for a year. 19,200 times seven. $134,000 for this chick. Oh my goodness! Are you kidding me? We was at an a antique store last night and they had it behind a case. You could actually buy it from somebody. It was a check from a mining company. I guess the woman worked there as a clerk or something like that. But her wages, and this was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, $88 for the month of September. 88 bucks. That was good money. That was good money for somebody like that. Okay? So anyway, so hundred whatever thousand dollars he's going to pay for this girl. That's love. Girls, get you a man that is willing to pay $150,000 for you. Amen? And earn every bit of it. That kind of came out wrong, but you get the idea. Amen? I mean, don't let them hire you. Yeah. I didn't say the wedding cost $150,000. But here's what Laban said. It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had her, or had to her. Now, what we're going to do is we're going we're to look at Christ and the bride in this. We'll do it next Sunday night. But I want you to think of this now. So Laban now has got Jacob locked into this thing for seven years. Now, he's also got seven years to look for a husband for Leah, the older sister. But remember, she ain't pretty. Okay? But as my old deacon, Dale McCurry, used to say, Mike, don't worry, son. There's a lid for every pot. I love that man. Let's stand to our feet. He was a godly man. He was. I loved him to death. He actually, he actually loved me so much about, oh, ten some odd years ago, maybe more than that, he tried to steal me away from here. Huh? He called me one day. He was, him and he had, his wife died of cancer and he had remarried and boy, she was a sweetheart. She was, I loved her. And, um. Uh, his first wife was real high strung, okay? She was kind of mean to us kids when he was little. But anyway, he was going to a Free Will Baptist Church down there in Springfield. And they were looking for a pastor. And Dale called me. He was their deacon down there. Mike, how's it going at Bethel? I said, Dale, I mean, if it, if it was any better, I think I'd just have to quit. Because I wouldn't be able to stand it. He said, well, that's all I needed to hear then. And he told me what, he said, we're looking for a pastor and... He said, I just, I love you to death and I thought of you. I said, Dale, I, you cannot imagine how honored I am that you would call me and ask me that question. I'd almost do it just because it was you that called. But yeah, I knew it wasn't for me, so. And I knew Sweetie Pie would never go along with it either, so we just, yeah. Father, we love you. Oh, this Bible is so much fun. When we, when we really, really understand the types, the shadows, the ensamples, the pictures of it, I can see clearly in this story that Jacob 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that leaves us with a mystery. If Jacob is Christ and the two young ladies represent a church of some kind, who are they? Which one is Leah? Which one is Rachel? Which one was the firstborn? Which one was the first taken? Which one was the first chosen? And so, Father, that all of those things are left for us in the pages of the Scripture to find out. So, Father, bless these people as they study this thing out. Give them understanding. We'll meet together next weekend, Father, according to your will. And we'll study the Word of God together. Bless it, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.